This videotape is of John Grinder teaching the final four days of a 24-day NLP practitioner certification training in Boulder, Colorado, June 1985. In the previous 20 days of this training, participants have already learned all the basic practitioner-level NLP patterns and skills. John's job in this final four days is to help participants fully integrate these patterns and skills into their ongoing behavior. As John does this, at times he uses words and concepts which are richly meaningful to those who've been through this training, but may not be quite so meaningful to those without the background. For this reason, we're primarily recommending the videotape for those with some familiarity with NLP. NLP is the study of human excellence. It comes out of a discrepancy in my personal experience of uh, being taught by my mother. So, if you've got any complaints, you know who to direct your complaints to. <laughs> being taught by my mother that when I went to school, what I was going to get access to by going to school, this is the only way she could get me out the front door, was people who would teach me about people of excellence who had preceded me in my culture. That is, the educational system was the institution that would serve as the transfer agent between people of excellence, people who were doing extraordinary things or had done extraordinary things in my culture, language, and people like myself who were children growing up who wanted to have access to these, uh, the adventures of people who had gone before me, people who were extraordinary in some way. And I don't know what your experience was, but I know what mine was. So one way to think about this whole endeavor is it's, it's my answer to that discrepancy. I was disappointed. Uh, there were some really fine, fine exceptions to the disappointment that I experienced in educational systems in, in this country, as well as some I've attended in other countries. But in general, it seemed to me that they were teaching mediocrity, and that it, people were using a statistical approach. So rather than take uh, someone of excellence who was extraordinary in some way and study the patterns, the adventures of this person, they took somebody who was extraordinarily extroverted and operated in the world. They took somebody who was extraordinarily introverted, operated mentally with uh, precision and excellence with their internal representations, and they did a statistical analysis and came up with the middle. Uh, the middle, of course, is exactly what I'm not interested in. And I hope you're not either. The whole purpose of this technology is to arm you, not to make you better therapists, not to make you better business people, not to make you better human beings in any sense. That's not my goal. That's never been my goal. I don't really care much about that. What I am interested in is promoting human excellence. And the purpose of technology is to prepare you to go out and create your own models of excellence. If that doesn't happen, the program has failed, as far as I'm concerned. You may be happy, you may find yourself with better bottom lines in terms of your business. Uh, you may find yourself a lot more creative, a lot more powerful, able to do things with a single bound in uh, your professional <laughs> life, uh, you know, improve your relationships and your family, etc. That's all lovely, and I, I compliment you, I applaud you. That's, that's important. That's the fabric of your life. But that's your life. I have a different mission. As far as I'm concerned, my mission is to prepare you as best I can to take the technology, especially after you've had some months of integration where you're running these patterns and noticing responses and making adjustments and doing things backwards and inside out to find out what the limits of what you've been taught are. At some point you'll go, I've done this before. I don't want to do it again. I want to do something else. And as you begin to look around the world to figure out what else that might be, <coughs> it would be an interesting challenge to you that you might consider what I'm offering here as a way of guidance this morning. I hope you are seized and obsessed at some point in your future with human excellence. It comes in lots of forms. It has different colors and shapes, sounds attached to it, even smells different. But there is no scarcity of the issue of human excellence. In your daily lives, you have contact with people who may not be the well-rounded, uh, lovely person you would like them to be, but there are parts of them that are absolutely superb the way they handle this situation, the way they deal with that, how they think up a response here, 
how they execute it. Lots of possibilities in your everyday life, if you sensitize yourself to it. The real disaster as far as the educational systems in our country go, and again, there are a lot of exceptions, you should be so lucky, uh, is the idea that they set up self-fulfilling prophecies, set up perceptual biases, to teach you to scan for the mid-range in any human activity. And I'd like you to, I'd like <coughs> you to drop that, that's nonsense. You're certainly not gonna be, my particular objectives are not gonna be met. And I'm gonna make you partially responsible for meeting my objectives here. You can accept that challenge or not, obviously. So my proposal is that whatever you do with this material over the next few months, there's gonna come a point down the line where you've demonstrated to your own satisfaction that you've been successful in applying this material to yourself as well as other people. I should comment on that. If you can't access, anchor, and maintain your own state when operating in a personal or professional context, you have, you have absolutely no right to be messing with anybody else's states. In its applied form, NLP is, in a sense, the syntax of states. That is to say, what state will you decide to occupy in this relationship? What set of states? How are you going to shift state? What security are you going to use to shift state? What class of states will the states that you're occupying and presenting to the world do in terms of accessing and maintaining states in other people? It's all relational. There is no single resource state that will serve you well in the class of context you have to occupy in a daily run through your life. If you don't know that you're multiple personality, figure that out real quick. And the only difference between you as multiple personality people who are locked up is that you have metasystems or are developing them. And by metasystem, all I'm referring to is the fact that a multiple personality in a pathological sense, I think it's an evolutionary stage, by the way. I think the species is going through some remarkable changes. It has been for centuries, but it's really crystallizing in the century we happen to be in. R.D. Lang's famous for claiming schizophrenia is a natural response to a fragmented technological society. And if you've had any good fortune to be able to live with a tribal society, as I've had the good fortune several times, you'll know what R.D. Lang's talking about. There are mechanisms, there are relationships, extended family groups, hunting groups, tribal groups, where everything that you need in your development as a human being within the, the metaphor of that culture is available to you. So when Bill was a little kid, it was not his father or mother that disciplined him in the tribe. It was his uncle, his maternal uncle. And that's a function that's been in that tribe for centuries and centuries. Who were his teachers? Well, they were not consolidated in an institution somewhere where they taught mediocrity. They were the people in the tribe who were available at that moment in his development who could offer him the skills and behaviors that he needed as a model. In a coherent culture, such as the ones you can find still in certain parts of the world, tribal in nature, fourth world, so-called fourth world, you're gonna find all of those needs are available. There are functions available within the extended group, but not here. And so what happens here, we have to be a lot of the functions that are usually distributed in an extended network. So we become schizophrenic. But schizophrenia is not an adequate response. It's only two models. We need a lot more than just two models to operate. So we become multiple personalities. And as I started to say, there's only a couple of differences between me as a multiple personality and someone who's locked up for the pathology called multiple personality. And that is a multiple personality in a pathological sense is someone who's under external stimulus control. An odor comes up, a voice quality occurs, a certain pattern of behavior operates in the environment, and suddenly that person, without any voluntary choice being involved, shifts to a different persona. And they're amnesic for what they were doing a moment ago, typically. And those are the only two differences. The locus of control, as far as which persona I offer to the world, is under my control. I have the choices. I can choose whichever one I believe to be appropriate for the context I'm operating in. So I maintain the choice within myself of which of those faces I will offer to the world. And the second thing is, while I'm 
known altogether too widely for being amnesic for lots of parts of my life. It's not a requirement. I can, if I choose, remember my experiences, whether I'm talking about travel experiences I had in East Africa, or what I ate for breakfast, the river rafting trip I went in on, on the Arkansas River yesterday. The guy I was yesterday in the front of the boat and the guy I am today are really different. But I do have the ability to recall that experience and pull parts of it into this persona and use it. But those are the only two differences. I'm claiming multiple personality is simply an evolutionary stage. Some people get caught because of cultural values in the necessity of being consistent. What are you if you're consistent? Well, boring. <laughs> <laughs> Unless we play semantic games to go consistently flexible or consistently creative or something. But in general, consistency does apply that, that kind of experience. You also become you also lose your status as a hunter if you become consistent. What's the difference between someone who's hunted and someone who's a hunter? Direction? Perhaps. Uh, outcome? Perhaps. I think those are both legitimate responses. I'm searching for some other characteristic that distinguishes a hunter from a hunted one. Predictability. Predictability. To be an effective hunter, you have to be able at any moment in time to tell me, if I'm your teacher, what part of the feeding, mating, seasonal cycle, the prey, that is your object, is in at that moment in time. So if we transfer the metaphor literally to the issues of hunting as in the traditional culture, then if you're a good hunter, I can send you after any animal at any time of day or night, and you will know where they are and what they're doing and how to make the approach. What enticements, stalking, what tracking is required to succeed as a hunter? If the way you approach your prey becomes predictable, you've just lost your status. Not only as a hunter, because you'll fail, but number two, you yourself become vulnerable to be hunted. And it doesn't matter how good you are at what you do if you're predictable. These are themes I wish to develop over the, the run we have together here. But the biggest challenge is the one I started with. I want you to take this material at some point in your future and go, enough of that. I know how to do this. I do it elegantly. I do it with effectiveness. And I'm even efficient at it. I can get it done pretty quick. And you've savored it. And you've enjoyed your triumphs. And you recognize you're starting to repeat yourself. And at that point, then remember the invitation. And remember the technology that you've been armed with, prepared with, so that you can make your prey even excellent. And it's a hunt that enhances both the hunter and the huntee, and one which meets my objectives, which is why I'm talking to you this morning. Not for your objectives, but for mine. We'll get to your objectives in a moment. I want you to understand mine. There's a dovetailing of our objectives in the sense that that's what I want. And the easiest way that I know of for us <coughs> to get to the point where you'll meet my objective is for me to serve yours for a few days. Later. There are holes in your education and your background as far as what's happened here. Of necessity, there's a limited amount of time, energy, resources. I need to know about those. That's your part of the contract. My part of the contract is to deliver both what you want and, even more importantly, what I perceive you to need in terms of rounding out your education. A great deal of what we'll be doing here involves integration of skills that you've already been presented with that maybe have not attached in some core way to your own behavior. It may involve finding, for some of you, that you've already mastered it and integrated this class of skills, let's say anchoring skills, to the point where I have to take those choices away from you principle called stretch. And we've talked about this principle here, so you understand what I'm referring to. If you can, you may not. If you can, you have to. And it 
goes a long way to keeping yourself alive as you go through life. Let's take language learning. There's a man who lives in Vancouver, British Columbia, who Guinness Book of Records has just verified is the world's most advanced polyglot that they've been able to find so far. He speaks 42 languages fluently. Exactly. Oh, God. <laughs> 42 languages. More remarkable than that is the fact that he can go, let, let me give you an operational definition. Let's call first fluency a behaviorally defined competency whereby someone can speak with enough fluency in, a la in language X, not their native language, <coughs> that native speakers of language X in the contextual context of the culture are comfortable talking with them. Let's call that first fluency, roughly UNC. Some of you have achieved it, some of you have dreamed about it. <laughs> <laughs> some of you have done both. And this man can go from having no contact, written or auditory, with the language to first fluency in seven hours. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I agree, Joe. I thought I was really good, and I claimed 72 for me. Seven hours. This guy, I'm not even in this guy's league. He's operating in another world. <laughs> Which, of course, is an immediate signal to me I'm real interested. So, so, so you want to go to Germany next week? Well, <laughs> take a couple of days off and learn the language. You'll enjoy your trip a lot more. <laughs> By the way, notice that none of it, your associations, and this is the point of me talking about this, your associations with language learning are horrible. <laughs> Why does it seem that all words in Spanish, German, and French mean the same thing? You know, they all mean the same thing. Because they all refer to the same experience. The experience is pressure on your ears <laughs> and a, a corrugated cubicle like this. <laughs> I mean, the only way, the only, only, only way, there's some genius involved here. It's sort of a funny kind of genius. The only way you could be exposed to as much foreign language as you are in high schools and colleges here in our country and not learn it is the way it's taught. <laughs> Somebody did a great design. Wrong outcome as far as I was concerned, but great design. This language learning program, of course, would have no association with any experiences you already have in language learning because it would all be done unconsciously. You cannot do something. I mean, there are generations generations within the century of linguists, very confident ones. Some of, the, some of the people I used to work with professionally when I was a pure linguist, whatever the hell that is, who are brilliant and who have succeeded in failing miserably, individually as well as in teams, in describing the syntax of a single human language. No such descriptions exist. There aren't even anything close to it. But this man can do it behaviorally, not cognitively, he is not killing you. Far too complex a situation. He can do it in seven hours. Yep. As they say, the surfers and the just say, that guy is stoking, dude. <laughs> he is moving. And the demon states that he occupies are awesome. Demon states. Has that been mentioned to you? No. A prerequisite for genius is the ability to focus and delete most of your experience. If you think back to your moments of absolute focus, moments of personal excellence, you walk out of a situation, you've just done something superb. I mean, not just good, not even real good, it's superb. And somebody asks you, how the hell did you do that? How did you Your answer is only one answer can come back if you're on it. The answer is, I haven't got a clue. I have no idea what it is. And if you try to think about it later, all you do is go into a confusion state. What's going on? Well, one of the things that is characteristic of a, that moment of genius is the ability to focus so completely on the task at hand that you delete everything else, including reflexive consciousness. 
Where are you going to spend your seven plus and minus two chunks of attention? Well, I'll tell you one thing. You're going to spend part of it keeping track of what you're doing while you're trying to do it. It ain't going to work. Not like it could. If you could take and commit 100%. I've never modeled someone who I consider in the genius class who did not have that characteristic. It's almost a prerequisite. And notice what's going on is you're giving up conscious analysis. If you have to reduce your learning to that trickle, that linear trickle that goes through verbal language and consciousness, you can be a long time learning things. If you have the ability to switch gears, and I'm not saying that there's no place for conscious analysis. It's a powerful, powerful tool. It's over-contextualized in our culture. It's used where it shouldn't be used. A lot of places. But if you have the choice of throwing that switch and going to that focused state where unconscious learning, behavioral competency is the objective, I bet you could do what probably is. It's going to take some tuning up teaching you some skills, <coughs> but I'll just bet you you can do as well as you can do. I'm gonna. I invite you to join me. I don't know how to do that yet. I'm gonna find out. That's what NLP is about, for me. You have to make your own decisions to how it fits in your life, the niches you've occupied, or start switching niches, however you want to think about it. Well, that's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm doing here in Boulder. I said NLP, for me personally, as one of the creators of it, has recoded itself in recent years to the syntax of states. Is what are the class of states that you can choose to occupy in which sequence in order to accomplish certain specified tasks? It's like change. You can only resist change if you recognize it consciously whether it's organizational change or personal change. <coughs> it's going on all the time. The only ones you resist are the ones that are called to your attention. That's why I really have a strong value system that says that conscious mind activity in the class of organizational personal change is a dire mistake. It's like the language learning program. It's probably the only way it won't happen. It's like a therapist's office. It's the least likely place for change to occur classroom, the least likely place for, for learning to occur. The conference room, the least likely place for a good contract to occur. Those things are always done somewhere else and then formalized if they're done well. If you really try to do them in those contexts, you have problems. So I would encourage you to use the self-hypnosis patterns, meditation, other avenues that you've explored, whether it's sketching with your other, your non-dominant hand. There's lots of <coughs> avenues into it. And the particular objective you have in using all the states is to, is to build your own flexibility. <coughs> that is, you can switch states, and you can switch states with precision and with no residue. Notion of separator state, are you familiar with that terminology? That's like an anteroom between two states, right? A connecting corridor. You go through that separated state because you do not want to contaminate either one of the pure states that you have. Uh, there was a woman with me in Bali when we were uh, playing gamelan together. Gamelan is a, well, it's lots of different kinds of gamelan. Gamelan means orchestra in Balinese. And usually a full gamelan is 40 or 50 guys playing with such precision, it's unbelievable. But there are smaller versions of it. One is a gunder, which is a, a special kind of gamelan. It's a like a xylophone affair. It has um, bamboo resonant chambers with metal keys, brass usually, uh, hung across the top of them. So when you strike them with a hammer, a mallet of some sort, it echoes. So you get different tones, both from the quality of the metal, the brass, as well as the characteristics of the echo chamber, the resonating cavity, the bamboo. Fine. It's um, in Balinese music, as opposed to Western piano, uh, on the gunder, your right hand is your rhythm hand, and your left hand plays melody, does a soloing. I had an accomplished pianist in my group who looked at that <laughs> <laughs> after all those years. 
it was important for her to have some way to keep those worlds separate. Just like learning a language, by the way. The problem with our language programs is that we, we, we're not taught to speak or understand language. We're taught to translate. Translate. The way you know the word Hund in German means dog is because you're given a word list. And you go, Hund, dog, Hund, dog. So there's no dogs, there's no dog shit, there's no barking, there's nothing around that has an immediate value to let you know there's a Hund. <laughs> if you stepped in it once and it was called that, the, the experience would be powerful enough, you'd never forget that word. Right? In fact, you won't. <laughs> we didn't even do it here. <laughs> the problem is that if you're not given experience to attach words and phrases to, you can only translate back into your native matrix, right? Which is a 100% defeat of the point of learning a language to begin with. Languages are just different ways of carving the world of experience up. There are a series of perceptual filters which cause you to attend to certain parts of your environment and ignore others. Not because they're true. The epistemology of language is junk. Like any belief system that I've run across. But it is the accumulated wisdom of the people who have gone before you. You know the story, Eskimo has mm -hmm. words for snow. Why do they have much words for snow? And, and you don't actually around here, you have quite a few words for snow, too. But let's go to Phoenix, Arizona. It snows snow. And the accumulated wisdom of the people, in some sense, is encapsulated in their vocabulary, in the set of distinctions, because every word or phrase is a way of forming your, your expectation. That is, by naming things, we call them the habitual perceptual awareness. So when you learn another language, strictly speaking, no two languages are translatable. You can't translate from another language into your own. You can certainly operate in one and in the other, but straight translation, no, not real. So if all you're offered is a cubicle and a pair of earphones, you are driven to translate. That's the most effective way to not learn. What you need is a separate reality. What you need is a state which is so disassociated from English or whatever languages you speak, that when you hear that language, your native language, spoken externally, or you trigger an internal auditory loop in yourself in English, it sounds like gibberish. If you can do that, then you can create a place for this new world to grow. Because initially, it's very fragile. There's a strong tendency, especially for us Westerners, to fall back on understanding. Confusion is a state to be escaped from. I mean, that's really a travesty. Confusion is, a, is an indication you're about to learn something, if you can stay with it. I mean, if you weren't confused, you wouldn't be learning anything new. If all you were doing were pigeonholing new experiences into old categories, all you're doing is making more concrete the perceptual biases, the distortions, which you have found useful in the past. And they may make them useful in the present, but in the future you're going to die. The Peter Principle is a demonstration that business understands this principle and doesn't have a clue what to do about it. <laughs> I mean, the Peter Principle is formulated half humorously and half seriously as you're always promoted beyond your competency, right? That's a really unuseful representation. There's another formulation of it that is useful, however, that says every time you change context, internal or external, whether you're promoted from sales rep, leading sales rep in the region to sales manager, or you're moved from director of personnel to executive vice president in charge of planning, whatever change you make, requires a complete review, renovation, in terms of the class of strategies you're going to employ. Can't be done consciously, by the way. Impossible. If you prove me wrong, I'd be interested. But I don't think you can do it consciously. So the Peter Principle really should be formulated something like that. That is, whenever you change, go back and review for yourself 
using all the states would be a very far away. Because you've got to be willing to give up your successes, because those are the most dangerous part of your experience. You succeed, you tend to confirm what you already believe. That gets confirmed a couple of times. You're one superstitious man or woman. You start wearing the same shirt, the same shoes, the same tie, the special contracts you really need to close. And you go through certain ritualistic behaviors which are so deeply embedded in your behavior, you don't even know they're ritualistic. Nothing wrong with ritual as long as it stays alive. But as soon as it gets ossified, as soon as you have orthodoxy, you're in trouble. So I would urge you, in terms of altered states, to play. That is, to go in. You know what an intensive definition is as opposed to an extensive definition? Is that a term that you're familiar with? No. You know the phenomenon. Let me just attach it to these code words. I can give you a list of all the people who, in this room whose names begin with S. I'll put skip at the top of my list here, right? I could go around and assemble that. What have I just done when I said that, that I could give you a list of the names of, uh, of the names of people whose names begin with S in this room? I've given you a set membership rule. I, now I could actually ask Skip to do that. So come back with that list. Now, how would he go around and decide who goes on the list? Well, he'd look at Sally. Uh, yes, yeah. Gary. Out. Rob. Out. So he could go around and do that, and he could give me an explicit, extensive list of those people. Or I could simply refer to that same group of people the way I gave him a, the decision process which he used to compile the list. <coughs> one is just the list of people. The other one is a, a decision process. It's a set membership rule. It tells him how to decide who goes on the list and who goes on some other one. In this area, you want intensive definition. You want enough rapport with your unconscious, you can go, go find or get for me the blah, blah, of the blah, blah, blah. All of the times in my personal history that I have used focused states. Review those visually, auditorily, kinesthetically for me, please. With the mind of offering me, not cognitively, who needs that at this point? behavioral examples of how those apply to my present situation, in particular in my area of personal relation, in this profession, in this contract, with this client, with my child, so that you bring from your personal history exactly that class of resources and bring them to bear in present situations. Notice that you can't go back and list those experiences right now, but you can't ask for them using an intentional definition. The unconscious is quite good if you're precise about your intentional definitions of seeking and finding and making those things available. Then you can anchor it when it occurs in your behavior, self-anchoring, right? Then you can go after some other set of altered states. The times when you were attentive, completely attentive to someone else, fully out, fully connected with this other person, and you didn't understand a single word that they said. <laughs> a content-free state of attentiveness. You know how powerful that is? This gentleman, and I'm sh I assume there are other people, raise your hands if it's true, are fluent in languages other than English. How many people are... Okay, so look around, get your hands up nice and high. Now, sometime, have a conversation with them. A three-minute conversation in which they speak any other language than the one you understand. And your task is to be so fully attentive at the end of that, you can tell them what they were talking about. And how are you going to know that? By their body movements, by the voice fluctuations, the tone, the timbre, tempo qualities. And the other criterion is that Jerka, in this case, if he were to talk to me now in some language that doesn't understand for three minutes, would have at every moment in that conversation a sense of absolute connectedness between us, even though I was understanding absolutely nothing he said. Verbally. So there's focus states, second class of states, content-free states of attentiveness. Then you take that, you got a little anchor for it, right? Because it occurred in your behavior, as you requested. And now you directly apply it to, quote, problematic situations you have. You come and tell me what happened. It'll make a big, big difference. 
So the issue here is play. And in particular, playing with the full cooperation and resourcefulness of your unconscious in terms of seeking out certain classes of states and then applying them to your situation and finding out what the effects are. Pick something you can't do. After you've assembled a half a dozen of these extraordinary states, pick something you really can't do. You can't sing. You can't draw. You can't dance. I don't know what you can't do. And then go into one of those states and surprise yourself. See, it's only the one who's sitting here listening to me that can't do those things. There are other ones there. Remember the notion of multiple personality? There are many women there. There are many men here. Do they know what their stage entry cues are? Do they know when to take stage center and when to withdraw and passively support? I have been, and I will continue to do so. I have been. You, you wake up and notice what's going on. You invite your unconscious. A demonstration about how to lead someone else into those states, yes, you'll have that. Officially, I mean, up here. It's been going on, but it's hard for you to see. What you can already register is what I'm doing up here. How many Johns have been here this morning so far? And how do you know that? Okay, I got a task for you. It's a real easy drill. Three person group, so Carol and Georgina and I. And I'm gonna be first client. You're gonna be first programmer. You're gonna be first meta person. I want you to access, using my resources, in me, or get me to. I mean, the best of all worlds is just give me back the instructions I'm going to give you as programming. You go, okay, John, do it. You're there as my consultant to make sure I do it with full strength, full vigor, all the resources. I want you to go after and find, help me find within my own personal history, even if you have to create it, um, two most powerful learning states that I can find. One may be, in my vernacular, curiosity and playfulness, some mix of those two. Another may be focus and determination. I don't know. They can have, the names are not important, the states are. You can proceed by any of the mechanisms you played with already. You can start to teach me something, and when you see I'm really getting it, you can anchor it. You could uh, do it by metaphor. You could tell me a story. You haven't been, quote, instructed in metaphor. That's part of the request that I've gotten so far. But certainly, you can think of examples which have the elements I'm talking about, where somebody succeeded at doing something by learning at an accelerated rate. Something. Notice whether it changed. No, by the way, there's a rule here. If you use verbalization as, as any part of this exercise or any other exercise that I run, all verbal communications must be considered unverified rumor. <laughs> until they lead to a detectable physiological state shift. As you can tell me to become resourceful, and it may work. I may have the resources so immediately available I can become what you've asked. On the other hand, your job in any verbal communication is two steps. You deliver the verbalization, and as you do so, and you continue after the verbalization stop, you're scanning with full attentiveness externally to discover whether I make a physiological shift. And if it's in the direction which you guess, and it is a guess on your part, is the direction that you were inviting me to go. You can give me feedback. Hey, do you call that resourceful? <laughs> Show me unresourceful then so I can find some difference. <coughs> you can be provocative in that way. You can be warm and genuine and supportive now. I know you can do better. Blah, 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 blah. You can stand on your head. I don't really give a damn what you do, except you've got to be able to verify by your own sensory experience that I did what you requested verbally. Notice you can skip all this if you don't do anything verbally. How could you do this exercise non-verbally only? Larry, think about that, huh? Well, what did I do with you a few moments ago, Dan? Adjusted my posture. I adjusted his posture. <clears throat> he was thinking. Thinking means his head goes out like this. <laughs> so I invited him to think in a different posture, and your thoughts changed. So you could do it directly by body mode. 
you could you could do it by mirroring. You could mirror whatever I'm doing and slowly adjust your posture. And if you're occupying my consciousness enough by some nonsense babbling, right? serious nonsense, though, then you can get me into a body posture without touching me, which may at least give me some. By the way, you know the number one rule here is before you even ask me to go after resources, you've got to make a determination by looking and listening as to whether I'm in a state which is resourceful enough to do what you're asking me to do. So, if I'm in a physiological state that you recognize as less than resourceful, your first job is to change that, and then you make the request. So, her task is to assist me as the client in accessing and anchoring, self-anchoring, so I can run these anchors myself anytime I want. Two states which you believe are strongly connected with excellence in learning. I've offered some names. I have no idea of what they mean to you. They're nominalizations. Pick your own. And better than that, skip the damn names. Use intensive definitions. I was talking to Carol. Go find a time and a place in your life where you learn something with such rapidity and thoroughness, and you didn't even realize as you were doing it, you were doing so, that it was only subsequent to the learning experience you realized what a tremendous distance you had moved in short period. That's an intensive definition, right? It doesn't list with specificity what those are. It invites your unconscious to explore and find the class of events. I would anchor me as I'm anchoring myself. So you make the, the worst case would be the verbal mm -hmm. approach, the one I just gave you. Anything else is preferable, by the way. If you want to use words, okay, <coughs> but you have that extra requirement to verify state shifts. When you're satisfied that I look and sound like I'm in one of those states, you've been provocative or supportive, I don't care how, but if you make that determination, then anchor it, make sure I anchor it. Critical I anchor it. And that's all. Now, you can verify the quality of your work with Carol. So there's state A and state B or something, I don't know. <laughs> You ever see the little the Doc Savage movie that I made where every time he looked at the camera, little little stars came out of his eyes? <laughs> something in that area. Some some sensory grounded representation lets you know something important is going on with the resource. Then Carol's sitting there, and what's Carol's function? Well, standard functions of metaphysician. One, she you will offer a critique of Georgine's performance at the end of her cycle she's done that, when she's satisfied she's got those two states anchored. <coughs> Number one, has to be sensory, but by the way, I give you a choice. It either has to be sensory specific, <coughs> that is, when you reached over to touch John's left shoulder, when he was in that state, your touch was rough enough, it interrupted the state. So you anchored the interruption, you didn't <coughs> anchor the state. Remember, you had to go back and do it again, softer and smoother. So that tells you something about the quality of the touch, that's important. That's sensory grounded. If she goes upset a state, how well it interrupts this pattern specifically, he changes breathing, muscle tone is in his face. So you can get down to very specific representations for her. What does Georgine do with this information, by the way? So I just give you a critique as meta person. What have you done with the information in the past? <coughs> how do you do that? You change your, your behavior. How do you change your behavior? All you got was words. What do you do with them? They won't change your behavior in that form, that's for sure. Future facing. Future facing. What does that mean, future facing? Make a new representation of how it will be different. Or do it again. Or do it again. So best of all worlds, you just do it again. Second best of all worlds, you do it again here at high speed. As you go back. So Carol says to me, when you reached over to anchor Georgine on the knee, your, your, rough, your touch was rough enough that it interrupted. And I go, now I back up my visual my auditory and my kinesthetic tapes to remember the specific point she's talked about in the interaction. And now I, I realize, yeah, I leaned forward, I actually lost balance. I fell forward on her knee. It wasn't intense. So, but I didn't notice it then and do something else. <coughs> you had to critique it later. So what I do is I back up to the point just before I make the less than optimal move. And now in all representations, with the same specificity that the original experience is stored, I store right alongside it a branch for 
That is, everything went nice. Da, 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 we're going along. Da, da, da. And now here's this thing that happens right here, which is <coughs> So I create a branch point at that point. I drink through it again. And this time, my touch is about in. So I continue along here, and she gives me another critique of a thing that happened in this line. But it could also have happened. Or I go back here and I figure, okay, the other, the other way I could have done it is not use tactile angry at all. I could change my voice. So I dream through <coughs> optimal variations on the thing that was not optimal. And if I quote dream through it, I'm talking about rerunning video, audio, and kinesthetic tapes. If I go through it, these alternatives, with the same specificity that I store the original experience, these will be as likely in the future as the actual Notice I'm building an experiential base of my own technology. You know the story is at Arizona State University where they took half the team and had them shoot free throws from the floor and the other half shot them from the stands. No different statistic. With some people, a big improvement if they didn't shoot. Why? They were practicing successfully. If you shoot the loose and Charlie, you never do. <laughs> But if you, if you feel or watch somebody who's a, a good athlete do the hallucinatory drill, you'll see all the muscle movements at the micro-muscle level that would occur if they were out there. So their body is practicing. And it's always practicing without mistake. So this becomes an experiential foundation. You never do to something the first time out there. Get it ready here. Then you go confirm how close to the optimal you get. So that will be a standard part, not only in terms of the function that the meta person has, in terms of offering feedback, but what you do with it. You relive it. You back your tapes up to the point in time where those cues were available and you didn't act upon them. And now you act upon them effectively. And then dream out the sequence of ways. Another kind of feedback I want you to start doing systematically here. Suppose that this is the example, right? Now, you could tell me with specificity where that happened and how it happened, etc. Or you can tell me metaphorically. I don't want you to occupy the ground in between. That's opinion. I'm not interested in your opinion. I'm interested in your feedback and your aesthetics. The feedback is either sensory specific or it's completely metaphoric. What would be a metaphoric way of giving me feedback if I had done one of these? Let's try one liner. Let's not get fancy. Let's go to metaphor. One liner. So you think inside of yourself, Carol. What example from the world of experience could I call to John's attention, which is already resonant in his neurology? So he knows it's true. It's not something I'm proposing. He's had the experience. Which would make the point, metaphorically, that I'm trying to get in terms of a change in his, his work. So she looks at me and she says, how is it possible for one of those beautiful red-winged blackbirds that you see in the spring to land on a delicate stem of a, a stem of grass, right here, without breaking. So by mentioning the incident, calling my attention to some aspect of it, you've invited my unconscious to find out where that principle, which I have in my own experience, applies to what we've just done. So I'd like you to give two classes of feedback, sensory grounded, <coughs> and by the way, it's only sensory grounded if the person who it's directed to can find the incidents in their tapes. So you may have to work harder at it than I'm proposing here. And then at the end of the sensory grounded where I confirm, yes, thank you, Carol, I found where that goes. Let me set it up. Shall I go back and do it? Okay, I got it. And now you offer me the metaphoric stuff, or one or the other. I'd like you to try both for a while, just so you get used to the difference between the two. What I don't want is you made, when you did this, you made her feel such and such. What I want is either pure metaphor or sensory ground representation. Stuff in between stages. Yes. Would you uh, refer to a metaphor in that particular example of the touch? My mind, first of all, went to a metaphor of somebody of the negative, say, aspect of it, of maybe telling you. Uh, somebody might have jolted you by waking you up when you're changing from one state to another. Uh, can you say Perfectly legitimate class. There's, there's lots of ways to classify metaphor. 
Yeah, let me just take the difference between the two. One is positive frame, one, quote, is negative frame. Yeah. Negative frames are not negative. I don't want you to see, you know. If I say I'm talking to a specific person about a particular point, the specific person and the particular point are not specific or particular at that point. <laughs> even though you tend to treat the, the language like that's nonsense, just straight hypnosis. It's a politician. Now, <coughs> similarly, negative metaphors are not negative. They can be very powerful, positive. Okay, what I want you to do as opposed to what you did. Right. So, I offered a metaphor that said, here's a model for your behavior. Apply it. The, but, the, the red winged blackbird. You offered a metaphor for what not to do. By implication, you're inviting the person to shift that class of behavior to something that's more efficacious. And you, in particular, have mentioned a negative consequence of the way they're proceeding. This helps them actually to identify where in the sequence they should take their tapes back to. Perfectly legitimate. And again, oh, there is one rule I didn't mention. After you've offered the sensory grounded representations as a metaphors, feedback, you are available to refine them until the person who they're directed to exits accesses the point in time where you're referring to and makes their adjustments. <coughs> That's part of your responsibility. However, when you offer the metaphor, whether it's this frame, the one Barbara's offering, or the one I offered, you may not discuss it. You never explain a metaphor <laughs> that robs it exactly of the point of it. A metaphor is an invitation to the other person's unconscious to participate in the strongest possible way and make sense out of the situation. And it is insulting to explain a metaphor, not only to them, but to you. Because I want you to become more and more artistic about this. And you know, for example, if you, you can take a fine piece of poetry or writing and subject it to a literary analysis and tear it to shreds, so there's nothing left. Leave it <coughs> in its form. You backtrack the exercise. Three-person exercise. I'm going to give you roughly 15 minutes. I'll make adjustments as I go around monitoring what's going on. A client whose task it is to find and anchor so that they have voluntary access to two accelerated <coughs> learning states of excellence. A programmer, an operator, who does the minimum consistent with the client getting their outcome. <coughs> I'm an anarchist. That's the only function government has, is doing the minimum necessary to get the community outcome. That's your job. But it is your job. So if I claim I can do it by myself, and I sit here and do it by myself. You've got to verify I did. That's why I want you to anchor in the same states I'm anchoring. So later in the day, you're going to wander over and go, how are you doing today? <laughs> well, you know, and make sure that you get the state shift that was present when you first did the anchor, or I did the anchor. And Carol, feedback, she's my representative in the group. I may walk right up and go, what's she doing? What's that got to do with it? And you now have to understand the structure of the instructions now to be able to tell me whether what she's doing is or is not relevant. If it's relevant, then my applause. If it's not, then I'm going to talk to you about her relevancy. Because <coughs> you're my representative in that group. I want you to take that seat. By the way, it's the best learning position. You get to sit back and watch and listen to a, a dance or a song. What's the <coughs> song? What's the dance? Make sure that's the resonant properties and there's a great <coughs> and metaphor in the sense of your metaphoric feedback and sensory feedback. So those are your responsibilities as metaphors. Being nice in this group in terms of exercises is insulting. <laughs> if you take each other seriously, you will insist on performances outside the expectations of the person who's performing. You will push them, you will prod them, you'll kick them. You'll smother them with affection as you drag them toward the targets. I don't care how you do it, <coughs> but by God, insist on more than what you're getting. That's always a good rule. <coughs> now, the evidence that I have succeeded and you have succeeded lies in the meta person. This is the piece I didn't give you before. When I have two states accessed, self-anchored, and you've thrown an anchor in too for backup, then you both close your eyes. You've both been watching. You've calibrated my states, right? You both close your eyes. I go through some separator state to the anchor for one of the states, A or B, and you name them A or B, one or two, black and white, green and yellow, I don't care. Any non-content designation. 
I go in, I don't tell you which state I'm going to access, but I hit that anchor and I go into the state that's automatically associated with that anchor. And I go, yes. And you hear me say yes, you open your eyes, and you individually pull up one or two fingers as to whether it was the first or second state, A or B, black or white, green or red, however you designate that. I want you to independently verify at the sensory level that you can recognize the state I've gone into. That's a demonstration that I have indeed self-anchored. You can verify it externally by calibration. Separate. You don't want them stacked? No, I don't want them stacked. I want them kept separate. Because I'm going to have you play with the difference between the two. Now, suppose we want run into the case where I go, okay, close your eyes, and I hear. And you come back and you go, it's A. And I go, no, it was B. No, Use your anchor. You've got one set up for the state I tried to get to, right? So you hit that anchor and see if it works. Or maybe just internal to my own self anchoring mechanism. If you can both verify by your sensory experience that your anchor worked, then you can transfer the anchor to me. I, you can hold me in the state on my <laughs> Then retest it. I want you to do quality work. I want you to have the sense of leisure in doing this 15-minute exercise per person. I saw skiing, which is great on the ski slope, but I don't particularly want to film myself skiing with you. Right. right. So I don't know what's going on in that path when you can see it for four months. Okay. Uh, anyone I want to address the, I'd, I'd rather group resource respond and then I'll offer anything that uh, I don't hear you, you offering. So, so how do you help her make sense out of this and more specifically and more usefully, so what can she do either in instructing her operators or adjusting her internal strategies so she doesn't have the difficulty? You, do you understand the issue? By the way, let me back that off. Before I ask for a response, here's Evelyn. She's available for questions. There's a really strong tendency in our culture, uh, the metaphor and managerial practice, to characterize the difference between the Japanese managerial systems and the American managerial systems is American managers. The metaphor is ready, fire, aim, 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 right? And the Japanese go ready, aim, 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 aim. They don't have to fire. They close on the target directly by a group process, which is fascinating which, by the way, was originally inspired by an American who went to Japan because in the 30s he couldn't get his theories attended to here in the States. At any rate. What are your questions of Evelyn in order to make a useful response to what she's offered? Is the picture not connected with the feeling at all? Like, you maybe immediately get the picture, but you never go to the feeling state? No. The whole thing comes back up. As, so, as, a, as a single gestalt. Right. Okay. Okay. She even has auditory there. She's right. I get the whole thing. The whole thing. So it's an intact fortune. Good question. That's an important. If that weren't true, the intervention would be different than if it were true. Did you say so what? Yeah, so why? So, so what? Right, 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 right. No, no. He said so why. So do why. Oh, oh so do why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just say <laughs> 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 so there's, an, there's another example of the same phenomenon. We got an epidemic. <laughs> no, I didn't so, understand the wait, wait, wait. You didn't understand that. I didn't understand what part. You get So I go, remember a time when you were balanced, uh, your body was fluid, uh, you had the sense of control over the, your own situation, uh, and maybe there was some excitement, blah, blah, blah. And she goes to ski. Okay. Some crazy place you all ski. And now, and I'm after the kinesthetics, right? That's what she's asked me to help her sort. She but wants that same resource state, kinesthetically defined, to transfer to another context. Yes. And so I'm watching like a hawk, and I see her go into the state, and I reach over and I anchor it. Now, later when I anchor it, sorry, later when I use that anchor, she goes back to the image and the sounds and the feelings, etc. Okay, so good so question. what's wrong with that is I'm skiing instead of listening to him. You're listening when? You're supposed to be No, I only want to ski on the ski slope or when I'm daydreaming. The purpose, I thought, of the exercise is to anchor in a, a feeling state that I can transfer to other situations. What happens is I transfer the whole thing to other situations. Well, no, I've been doing that too. And... <laughs> it is an epidemic. It is an epidemic. Okay, so, 
<laughs> so wait, are you done, Carol? Yeah. You got your information? Right, exactly. I got the information. So now you join the trio. Here you go. <laughs> and what happens and what do you want to happen? So you, right. you don't so what's the difference stand between up the target and start jumping around. What I would like is to have the anchor transfer the feeling state and not the imagery so that my attention is on the here and now of what's going on with the feelings transferred into the here and now. With what deleted? I can't believe I'm being unclear. Unclear. The picture of skiing. Thank you. Uh, yes. Could you try to make... Try to raise up. Say it again some other way. I'll okay. Could you... <laughs> Would you? I will. Okay, May. ski May. with your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> Kill myself. <laughs> I like what Hal's doing, but he just got unequivocal feedback that yeah. there has to be some adjustment made. Um, ski down the hill and close your eyes momentarily and see if that feels comfortable. If it does, can you maintain the comfort of that feeling? Take that with you. Know, Leave the visuals behind. There's a distinction he's not yet making. Okay. What distinction is he not yet making? She needs to know. Not I mean, I don't know the answer to a question that he's presupposing an answer to. And he's having <coughs> problems here because of presupposition is false. Please, de Emily, please demonstrate. That, that would be an excellent test. Let me stay with this, this refi more refined. I'm trying point. to refine what he says. Okay, wait, wait. okay. Please demonstrate to how uh, reliving that experience here in this room. Okay, so okay. this comes prior to that. That's not a bad move. But let, me, let me get you another distinction here. What image? <coughs> The image disassociated or integrated perceptual position makes a profound difference given the task held on. Do you understand those, those terminology? Mm -hmm. Integrated as opposed to dissociated perceptual position. Now, if she wants to see, no. Is that no? I didn't catch the last thing you said. Disassociated as opposed to integrated perceptual position. Seeing herself over there on the slope skiing as opposed to seeing what the slope looks like as she actually makes the moves going down the slope. I'm associated. So he, she's inside of the frame. Yeah. You could predict that from mm -hmm. the response here. I mean, if she was just watching herself close her eyes over there, her response, if it was a dissociated perceptual position, would not have been a change in the kinesthetics. Mm -hmm. So notice you're, you're, you didn't make the distinction. You try a maneuver, which is a good maneuver, if the other case is the one that's... But it fails at the presuppositional level, and now you're going to dig yourself a deep hole. Because she's got that. Because she's got... Yeah, right. <laughs> now the kinesthetics have changed once again. Now this is this is this is real this is a really nice example of how making an assumption mm -hmm. can get you into a lot of hot water. Because now you've got two states that you have and one of them's anxious and so she's gonna want to go fast and resolve it, but so you gotta have pressure from her on resolution. Uh, <laughs> so you tell her to take a nice deep breath, you know, and now you ask the question that the feedback gave you. Notice I don't have any problem with your hallucinations as long as you know when you're hallucinating. And if you don't know, you've just presupposed a distinction. God, it's confusing over there. Here you are giving perfectly, it's, it's, as weird as your situation, here you're going, I can't believe I'm being this unclear. And you're over here going, what is with this woman? Can she even stabilize a state? Christ, she's been in the same program I have. <laughs> And you know perfectly well how far this is going to go. go. I think I need to go get coffee now. <laughs> so it's real important that you have a decision point here. And this is a very important point uh, as far as I'm concerned in your own uh, behaviors of excellence. You may presuppose a distinction, as he did, only if you know you're presupposing it. And take responsibility for seeking feedback that tells you your presupposition was erroneous. <coughs> See, had you known that distinction and then had decided, I'm going to scam it, I'm going to fluff it, I'm going to finesse it, <coughs> finesse the distinction, you did behaviorally, but you didn't make that step. Right? I'm going to finesse the distinction, then as soon as you saw the change in breathing and heart rate and her gesture, you would have gone, whoops, <laughs> let me back up. Here we are at the top of the run, you're looking around, enjoying the sunshine, the sound of the crunch of snow as other skiers go by you're ready to enjoy yourself on another run as you look down the hill. Notice you, you can now confidently say as you look down the hill because you know she's got an integrated perceptual image. 
again, um, I want to address her issue, but the process here is more important than the issue. As far as I can go. And notice it is endemic. There are other people who've had this experience. A little bit. If I just ask you simply for the healing, she she described the process, and I say, okay, uh, can you describe me what you feel? You go down the hill. Okay. And what will you get if you get that? So you'll get. I might get something. And then in the response that she tried to recollect feeling, if she won, I try something else, but she will do, if she will do it right yeah. away, yeah. I think that's enough. Okay, it might, that might work. It's a verbal approach, so I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna ask for other approaches. I want three or four examples. That might work. It's gonna be a little slow, because what'll happen is, as she describes the feelings, it will reinforce that class of feelings. At some point, you may get her focused enough on the feelings that the pictures will automatically streamline out. There are other ways to do it, I think, are more efficient. That will work, I think, uh, especially in an athletic event like the one we talked about. Yeah. I'm just interested to know why this upsets you. Never you mind. never get the no, 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 no. See, I think your intent is excellent. The formulation of your question is nonsense. You don't know why. I want to know why anything. Okay. Not in this workshop. <laughs> you go to the university and you ask why questions. Have I misunderstood, <laughs> or you say you want the feeling of when you're skiing, but you don't want the you don't want to see yourself skiing? She doesn't want to get the whole movie. Of her She's not seeing skiing. herself skiing. We already okay, addressed that. She's seeing the slope through her own eyes as she skis. What she wants, and I'm going to, she said it clearly enough, so I'm going to recapitulate it. Listen. And notice how much time and energy has been put into target state. You don't know what she wants yet. But the way you formulate the question is going to lead you into deeper water. No, no, it's not a screw up. It's an example of intent, golden, and execution. <laughs> How, can I All right. How do you know you're not integrating the feeling when you're thinking? I have integrated the feelings. The feelings are integrated in, in the a picture four quadruples or whatever they quadruples. call it. Right. Four tuples. So, what I'd like is to be right. able to transfer the feeling into a new situation feeling without the visual and the auditory. And that does not happen. No, the whole thing is Everybody know this, this, this magical ritualistic formula code? This is called the four tuple. The four tuple is a uh, obscure arcane way of referring to a symbolic representation for experience. We're building models, right? What is a model? A model is always a gross oversimplification of the actual thing you're modeling. That's the point of a model. It takes something complex and reduces it to something you can handle. This model right here says, experience has four major components in our system. It has an auditory, tonal, temporal, timber quality, that is the sounds of life. It has the visual component of life. It has kinesthetics of life, feelings, all that stuff. And the olfactory, if you'd like, olfactory gustatory. Most people in this country don't make a distinction anyway. Certainly not in most change situations. Maybe sometimes in restaurants. That's primary experience. If the superscript on all these is E for external. So at this moment in time, we could take Evelyn and come up with a description of what she has available to her in the sounds of life. Ventilation, sound of my voice, sound of people making shifts in their chairs. I don't know if you can hear you rubbing your nose, but I could. Right? Uh, <laughs> We could then get her to tell us everything that's available visually and then kinesthetically and then olfactory gustatory. If we had such a description, which would be absolutely tedious, it's a model, it's not to be carried out, it's, it's a way to think. <laughs> if we had that, we would have an instantaneous description of her experience, Evelyn's experience at time T, I, whatever time it is. <coughs> that's primary experience. Now, if we, if, we, if we take and remove all of these, ex E for external, right? Then we can go back and put eyes in here. That's for internal. We could explore her internal experience. In the sounds, of the sights, the feelings, the taste, the smells of life. That's yeah, available internal for her. Notice all this is primary experience. There's this funny thing sticking outside here that I keep trying to draw you away from since your backgrounds keep pushing you into it, which is a purely symbolic system. This is language, A to B, auditory <coughs> digital. The language is symbolic code you use for expressing yourself verbally, English and other languages. 
By the way, this is the menu. This is the meal. Don't eat the menu. <laughs> eat the meal. It's a lot more nutritious. You won't have certain other problems with it either. <coughs> what is she saying when she gives us the information? She says somebody comes along and elicits access with her resources. The in the a description which she can call skiing. That's the name of it. What she wants to do is to take this piece of it, leaving the other components behind, or at least out of awareness. And she wants to insert it into a new learning situation where her, the, her sensitivity to sound is external, her visual, uh, her, her attention as, as far as the visual parts of life is also external. These are not figuring largely in the situation, so we can leave them blank at this point. But she wants to transfer the kinesthetic internal of this state to a new fortune we'll call learning. We have now formulated her target state with precision. Enough precision to operate on it anyway. Notice what I said here. I did I said you would never actually fill in these descriptions. But notice this is a way of thinking. This is a way of formulating your own understandings of the situation. Not that you would now foss them off on someone who boardroom or in the therapy room or in the classroom, but as a way of staying oriented toward target states yourself, that is to make your behavior relevant and at some point elegant. Because you moving with elegance towards something means moving with economy. You don't crash around and move with precision. A dancer's move. What's the dance? Now oh, this is part of the background of the dance. The score. The dancer knows. Notice dancers don't get out and, and hand out the score. They get out and they dance. And if they're good, they elicit in you the same representations that they're trying to portray. All right, so, so we've got this much. This is the target state, and she's confirmed it. You haven't noticed, but yeah, that's it. Now, do you understand the present situation? The present situation is that when she pulls this in to this new state, this and this and this come along with it and prevent her and shifts these superscripts to a mixed state where she's partially skiing down the damn slope visually and auditorily and partially she's attending to the learning situation that she's presently engaged in. A mixed state. This is this a good representation of your situation as well? I'm not sure, but what I heard everyone say originally is the distinction that I want to make is she talked about firing the anchor. And when the anchor is fired on me, that's when I go to all four of those. Right. I'm not sure if I take them to a new state called learning or not. I, I don't know what that means. I don't relate to that right now. So I don't understand what you mean. Okay, I don't need you to understand. I'm asking you. You said the same thing happens to me. Yeah. The, what was the same part? The same part was that when someone fires off the anchor, right. I go through the whole experience, not just the feeling. Right. Okay, so all four things. Is there anybody for whom that is not true? What do you do? You just get a component of it? Yeah. Which component? Is it systematic which component you get? Kinesthetic. Okay. I a lot of times just the case. Just the case. Yeah. Similar. Similar? Yeah. I can get, if I go back and think about it, I can pull all the other pieces out. Right, but I'm talking about the automatic response. The automatic response is to go with the feeling. Okay. So, what would now be fascinating, assistant instructors, is to make a comparison of the strategy that she's using and a strategy that Bill's using, for example, and the strategy, say, Pat's using, K only, typical, and find out what is the difference that makes a difference in these three people's strategy. That'd be extremely rewarding. I don't know the answer to that question. I know how to answer her question operationally, how to give her the choice she's after. But in a sense, I'm going to ruin the experiment. I'm going to go ahead and ruin it. There are other people you can use for it because she made the request and she suffered long enough through this. <laughs> <laughs> Get her off the slopes. Do you understand how, how the difference is a difference that's very important in knowing how to address a face-to-face -face situation with another human being or a group, noticing that there are those differences? Did you all do those uh, sensory acuity drills as part of your first or where are you weekend? Mm -hmm. You remember them? Mm -hmm. Those are strategies. Minimum strategies. Two st Does everybody know what I'm referring to? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Does anyone not know what I'm alluding to? Okay. 
Okay, this was the case where, and so he closed his eyes, I snapped my fingers, Carol snapped her fingers. I said, is there a difference you can detect? And he went, yeah. I go, okay, well, who's this? Who's this? Who's this? Until he had six successes, and then we deliberately tried to make our snaps closer and closer together, so he couldn't make the distinction anymore. Then we asked him, how were you keeping track of that bill when you were succeeding? And he went, oh, I have pictures of the building or the soundtrack. One of the things that you were asked to do in the next couple of rounds of that was to deliberately use a system of storage of distinction, of difference, other than the one that was naturally there. Is that true? You were asked to deliberately switch your coding system. How did you succeed at that? Did you have trouble with that? I don't even remember it. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> It all comes together or none of it shows, right? It's a package. That's part of the difference that I'm talking about between Evelyn and Bill. How did you do that? Do you remember? So I'm working with Carol, and she can make really fine auditory distinctions. And I find out she's using a visual distinction. That is, when she hears this snap as opposed to Mary's snap, she sees an image of my hand as opposed to Mary's hand, and they look enough different in her iconics internally that that's the way she codes it. So all she does is she hears the sound and then sees a hand and goes, oh, is that John's hand or is that Mary's hand? Now, suppose I go, now, Carol, here's the invitation to increase your competency as a human being in terms of your coding, which is one of the most basic and powerful operations that you can get command over. I want you to now make a distinction kinesthetically to the sounds that you're hearing without supporting visualization. How would she do that? So, so I send the group off to do that. At least 20% of the group will go, I'm in a little heavy trouble getting out of the pictures. What did you do? Remember? <coughs> what worked for you? I you first Say it a little louder. I visualized an eraser. So she used the system to blanket. That is, she ran an eraser across the blackboard screen, <laughs> however she visualizes her internal display system, and kept it blank, thereby forcing her herself into some other coding system. She could have been more precise about where she went. That takes care of what not to do. Now, the issue becomes, what do you do? She could have put her body in the accessing posture you've learned is, is characteristic. She could have made an internal negotiation with her unconscious, saying, look, I'd like to give up this tremendously powerful and positive strategy that you've always run for me, named visualization, to explore the possibilities, to balance myself, support me by keeping the screen blind. What else could she have done? Listen with her cheeks. What I described. I, I, I mean, well, whichever cheeks are here. As long as you make these distinctions, as long as you have to give it. And by the way, they both work real well. I mean, during the calibration, when she hears me say repeatedly, snapping my fingers, she could put all her weight on her right cheek. And then all her weight on her left cheek when Mary was doing it. She would then feel a difference in pressure when she heard another snap because she's just anchored herself. She's shaped her own behavior. She's conditioned herself to make the distinction in a new system. If somebody's having a problem with a two-state calibration drill, say Carol's having a problem, and now I say, Evelyn, go into state X, and she changes, and I can see her change, I put pressure on the shoulder. And then I go separator state, blah, 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 go state B, and as I see the changes, I increase pressure on Carol's left shoulder. We do it a couple of times. And then I go, go to either state. And I, and I, as long as her eyes are pointed in the same direction, I can go, which shoulder am I touching? She'll feel pressure on one or the other because it's now an associated experience, right? All she has to do now is remember that that distinction here actually resides. This, this is a, she's having an intuition, by the way. She can't tell me visually. She looks at this person. She feels pressure on one shoulder or the other. She cannot describe verbally what it is that she's seeing that makes a difference, but she can feel the difference. She now has an intuition. All of you operate on these all day long in your professional work. An intuition is, if it's an effective intuition, is a report into your awareness without a representation of the process of the result of a complex process that goes on at the sensory level, which has cues that are minimal enough you're not aware of them or you're moving so fast because you're running a whole group of people that you don't have the time or the luxury to figure out what it is you're seeing and hearing 
you are a sensing device and you're making responses faster than you can keep track of your consciousness. So called up. So you can make up intuitions, they work quite well. Like this. Part of the process of NLP is to interest you in coming back to what source of your intuitions are. That is, what are you actually sensing at the, at the level of sensory experience that leads you to effective intuition? Because intuitions are vulnerable to mood. If you're in the wrong mood, and you're operating intuitively, you'll have a bad day. If there's an explicit technology underlying your intuitions, then you can always go to the technical level and make it work anytime you need it to work. There's no mystery about it. There's magic, but there's no mystery. There's a profound difference between those two things. So, now back to the issue that we started to work with. That would be a way for her to assist in deciding where she's going to go. We're talking about how to prevent a representation from interfering. <coughs> what could she do? Anybody, can you make use of the, the analogy with the sensory acuity drills to answer everyone's question? Wouldn't that help if she was trying to anchor a learning experience rather than Well, let's stay with the content. So you get the and, and that may be a good slide. You may want to slide around the corner and, well, inappropriate experience. Let's go to the learning experience. Um, I so. Maybe um, this is too easy. Avery. Maybe I'm asking a question too elementary. Go ahead. So let me try one more. Can I ask you a question? Okay. How was she anchored? Just the feeling. Wipe the screen. Wipe the screen. Wipe the screen. Put earmuffs on. Put earmuffs on. <laughs> Like Fine. Or thing. fill the system with something. So have her pick, not anything out of the steam portrait, but a visual and say an auditory component. Maybe exquisite silence, or maybe the sound of a running brook, softly in the background. Why not pick a scene from these beautiful, beautiful mountains you all live in? And pick something that's either in the auditory system quiet enough, but there, that it's comforting, you like the sound of it. And something sort of big enough in scope visually that you can put me or wherever you're learning from right in the foreground and still appreciate the beauty of that background. That is, why not anchor the individual components? Why not go get a visual that, a visual of, of the mountains and an auditory of a nice stream that runs down the mountains? And hold those constant while you bring the feeling in. So in the auditory acuity drill, all it amounted to was you picking some representation in the system you did not want to use for coding, but you typically did, and holding that constant. So in Carol's case, she could do the eraser bit. That's a sophisticated move on her part visually. Less sophisticated people would, would respond easier to the instruction of holding a image of their favorite uh, sunset. And as long as that that visual image was stabilized, they could not use it for coding. Therefore, they would force themselves into coding in any other system. Then the discussion about how to get into other specific systems becomes appropriate. But we have used the previous experience here to answer your question. Do you understand how to proceed? Mm -hmm. okay. So I've selected for Evelyn not to teach her how to instruct somebody in doing for her what's going to be done, but how to adjust her own internal competency so that she can accept input from a greater number. You don't always have the luxury of teaching somebody how to interact with you. They ought to know better anyway, but some people don't. Len. So what will stop Evelyn then from having this huge mountain mm -hmm. when she wants to learn? And does then Nothing, the except the mountain interfering with the feeling again? I mean, what will... Nothing, but the mountain supports the feeling. When she's going downhill at high speed, down oh, the okay. game, what she has to attend to is critical. You saw if we took her visual away what happened. So you've got to find something that supports. In a sense, it bridges the context. And it's not always, notice I gave you some well formed conditions for how to select it. That's going to be highly individualistic. If, if you did that mountain scene with me, uh, that would be horrible, because I'm a technical climber. And I immediately start looking for the, the most aesthetic line on one of the, the faces that I have in my visual image, right? And I won't hear or see anything else. I'm Looks like a layback there and maybe a 5'10 move across that. So I'm completely wrapped up in it. So there is no content I can give you which will always work, but there are principles of construction. 
that are far more important. Than that. I don't think I understand how to put this into practice. In other words, for me, when the anchor is fired, the pictures and the sound you decide bring back which the feeling. You decide which component of you want. I want the feeling, but if I don't see so you pictures, fill. I don't get it. How do you know that? You've never had it any other way, right? Well, that's true. Yeah. So hey. So what is a new door to walk through? So I'm saying I don't understand. He's saying, and I'm giving picture, you the mechanical this, instructions. Fire the anchor. I'm giving you the mechanical okay. instructions now. So right. what you would choose, Richard, is to take a visual and an auditory you think would support the state you want to move okay. to. And then hold those constants. Then invite the person to hit the anchor. Now, if you hold this constant, and you can have to vary pressure. I mean, this is a, an analog process. You may, the images of, say, skiing, in Evelyn's case, may start to intrude. Well, she, she pushes harder on the, on the anchor that gives her the state that she wants to maintain. So you're leaving open and free <coughs> this component, and you're holding constant these. Now try that. I'm not saying it's going to work. I'm saying I would like you to have the experience of discovering what happens when you do that. Now, if that doesn't work, what, suppose he comes back now and says that doesn't work. What are your moves? Oh, he already gave you the move. <coughs> I've never had feelings in a reaccess that didn't come through images and sound. That's an impoverished state for this guy. It's so impoverished, he doesn't know it's impoverished. It's a natural <laughs> way of life. <laughs> right. I've been happy all these years. You mean it can get better? <laughs> now you can tell me I could be happier? <laughs> Such the deal, right? What, what is the level of intervention that then you would make based on that comment that he made? I've never had except through... What's he telling you when he tells you that? He has a hardwired strategy. That is, in memory tasks, he gets the feelings, the kinesthetics, through the other systems. <coughs> what about teaching him to go direct? What about teaching her to go direct? That's an alternative. That is, she could hold constant the picture of the the weeping willow next to the babbling brook and get up and physically move her body through certain movements that are characteristic of skiing or Aikido or wherever the kinesthetics of balance and resourcefulness that she wishes to transfer the learning experience with you. Notice you are essentially taking, you're mastering your own experience. You're getting very close when you have that set of choices to creating your own very different experience than most people have of the way they go through their life. It has choices of, of extreme richness. Any, any of you who have discovered that you do go after certain parts of your experience through other systems, applause to you. And now the question becomes on my part, what else can you do? You never give up the choice that you already have, but you augment it with alternative ways of accomplishing the same set. Other comments or questions about it? Especially the, this is a really useful exchange. I appreciate you all playing the parts you play here. Yeah. So thinking about, if you were to take her and kind of like the hypnotic language thing, like as you see the mountain, see the season, etc., it causes you to have a particular feeling to have, you anchor it, and then do the same thing auditorily, etc. Stack anchors, when you end up, could you not get like you said, you're going to get a feeling in conjunction with the feeling or sound. Can you not get the feeling just pure with that anchor that that's the point? Yeah, you, you could. Erase those other ones to any depth? You could. Okay. Erasing is not. You'll get a, you'll get a mix. You'll get an integration. I don't. It, it's an important issue about anchoring. If, if you have state A resonant in someone and then you anchor state B, and now you hit and hold both anchors, the most basic change change, what is it called, collapse realities, collapse <coughs> knees, collapse shoulders, whatever you call it. <laughs> the collapse drill, collapse two, two experiences drill, right? I'm not trying to collapse, I'm trying to stack. I know. Well, what do you mean by stack? Like, uh, like you said, you're going to have a four tube representation of some experience. Right. And if we want to have the feeling to stay constant or to be able to be reproduced, if we get... Okay, stacking in that sense, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So, so, one of the things is going to, I'm making a more general point, let me reply to you. If I have A and B, and I hit A and B, if they're roughly of equal intensity, or I regulate my touch by feedback so that they are experienced roughly the same intensity, they'll integrate. 
and the person will have an A plus B state and everything in between. Multiple choices, lots of choices in that kind of integration. If, if however, one is much stronger, more intense than the other, it'll kick the other one out. It'll simply replace it. It won't be an integration. It'll be an alternating alternation of states. That's why even with two states of roughly the same, uh, sorry, diff seriously different intensity, I can regulate by pressure how much of one is. You're, you're cooking, right? You're, this is recipe time. Oh, a pinch of salt, but I need a lot of milk here. But then, you know, a little, I'll, I'll put a little more herb in here, whatever. So you really are by feedback. I mean, how, have you ever asked a good cook to teach you how to cook something you'd like to learn to cook? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you're in for a surprise. <laughs> you go, it's like asking a really good yeah. dance teacher. How many counts are there in this part of the dance? It's a single piece of, of work. It's a, you don't chunk it down like that. A cook will tell you, or you add a little salt. You go, well, quarter teaspoon? Well, you add to taste. And, and a good cooks don't have fixed measurements because even the ingredients vary in strength. And this is how they tell. You all know that. The stuff you really cook well, you don't have a set recipe for it. You have the basic ingredients, but you vary those. Sometimes you even forget, or you substitute something else. The way you know it works is right here on the tip of your tongue, literally. OK, so now to the stack thing. You're asking, won't, won't the hue of the mountain drag in the response to the mountain kinesthetically? Yeah, sure will. That's why it's important to pick four tuples that will support as background something that you wish to put in the foreground of the four tuple in a transfer case like we're working here. She's building a resource state for learning. She knows exactly what the kinesthetics are that she wants. The particular visuals and auditories that go along with it naturally skiing are antithetical to the learning environment. So she picks replacements for those, which she can anchor and hold, which do have feelings connected with them, but they're more general. They're less intense. They are supportive of the general movement that she's trying to create for herself. So the response that she makes, which is most, for most people, a suit, they feel soothed by the sound of an extreme going by. That'll, that'll be supportive kinesthetically of what she's trying to do, the balanced, resourceful, alert state. You can be soothed and alert at the same time. You put that in the background. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I know it's true for her. Because I just said it, and she verified it, right? So you may have to fish a bit to find out what's appropriate. In a group of this size, the more you have the person do, the less work it's going to be for you, and the more efficient and elegant the whole thing's going to be. That's true more generally than this group, but in this group in particular, since you're roughly of the same background experience with respect to technology, enjoy watching one of your mates here do something which you can learn from. And then you can go back and go, and Chuck, you could then go, okay, so Evelyn, how did you pick a mountain scene? Well, it's a, a thing I've seen a lot. It's, it's a positive association for me kinesthetically, but the feelings are not particularly intense, so they will support. The more intense feelings I'm getting out of that sense of speed, balance, and self resourcefulness I get in skin. All right. Anything else? In the area of the mechanics of this exercise. That little drill, I remember a guy who took the, the opening acuity drills, the ones I alluded to previously. By the way, uh, the, the, uh, these seats back here are probably the most useful seats if you want to learn about group interaction. Because you, you can see here what it is I'm responding to. So that, there's special positions here. I hope you enjoy them. Well, hi. <laughs> a guy who was an industrial consultant for a number of uh, cotton mills in the south, a whole big chain. We took those opening drills and made them into a safety program that reduced injuries to less than 2% uh, of what they had been in these mills. There was a, a, a situation where there was some sort of a, a sorting machine that had blades and so forth, uh, some part of the processing of cotton. And uh, the natural reflex was when it was a natural hum to the machine. When the pitch changed, it was an indicator that there was something caught in the machine. And the natural reflex was to reach in the machine and remove before the switch was thrown, which disengaged the gears. Right? And that cost a lot of people lots of fingers and hands and stuff. And that simple tonal drill that you did on the opening uh, weekend of distinguishing 
and then chaining, anchoring, movement or non-movement to the difference in pitch. Took that safety program to less than I think two or three. It was roughly two or three percent of the injuries as what it was before we instituted that program. That little drill in terms of application, and especially in terms of self-application, in terms of anchoring yourself, there's something you can't detect. You're not sure, but you know there's a difference. So when you call for one experience and then call for the other, even leaning or, or shifting your head back and forth, pressing on your knees, will really sort your experience. And the principle is, whether you use it for yourself or you use it with someone else, is that you always train an acuity in a system other than the one you're trying to make the acuity distinctions in. Mm -hmm. Minimal cues in the group. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> it's a visual distinction that he's after. So he cues himself to the difference tactfully. If it's an art, I want to teach you to hear voice tone shifts. What happens around the word but in English language, sentences of English language? The tone, the tone shift. Anybody not noticed that before? Has that been part of your training? Yeah. Ah, so that was already brought into the training. No. no. Uh, Margaret, would you say a sentence that has a but somewhere in the center of it? So, and make it relevant to your own you know, experience. I would like to go to the movies, but I'm not sure I will. All right. And Rob, could you offer me one? common about, you're listening to tone, I hope, you were cute. Well, there was a tonal shift in each case, right? And if you ask those people, or you produce a sentence yourself, unless you try not to, you will always have one. What's that an indication of? Sort. 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 Sorting is going on. I like his answer. Other people are using words like discount. Careful. There's a value judgment attached to that. This is descriptive. A person is sorting themselves. That is, the part that is producing the verbalizations and the physiology before the butt is a different part of that person than the one that's producing the tones and the visual, uh, the tones and what is visual to you, namely their physiology after the butt. Now you can, you can drag in certain claims like discounting, and there's a good basis for claiming that's discounting, but translates to and not. Uh, easy piece of linguistic evidence. Who speaks German here? So if the first half of the sentence has a negation in it, as opposed to the first half sentence doesn't have a negation in it, there's a different word, both of which translate into but in English, and what are they? Aber. Aber und... So if I go, ich bin hier, aber ich würde gehen, you can go out, as opposed to ich bin hier nicht, or ich, ich, ich bin hier niemals. What goes in there, aber? Doch. What's so the word that goes in there? I heard it. Zonda. Zonda. Right? Zonda. So even linguistic evidence, and, and it translates and not. So but in English translates X and not. So you know the phenomena of getting yes but. You know the effect it has on yourself. Now suddenly, if you had never heard tonal shifts before, a whole world of possibility opens up. That is, you can listen around this pivot word in English, but and here at different tonal shifts. So there's a training program already available there. Now, if I wanted to train <coughs> Sue real quickly and she had not heard that distinction, how would I train her? Using the principle I was just talking about. Or you can say it out loud, as long as you mutter it. <laughs> Have her sorted visually. Have her sorted in either one of the other major input systems, right? So I could say sentences like, yeah, I really want to go to the show, but I'm not sure how I'm going to arrange for the finances or the time or whatever. Uh, or I could I could cue her tactfully. That is, so I, I her, she holds her, her forearm up like a barometer, and I tap up here while this voice quality tone is going on, and then that's this butt I go down here and I talk to her, I tap down here. Notice that you can use your, your submodality work to know how to set up a natural overlap between the systems. That is. You, you don't want to go like this and then go like this. 
Mm -hmm. Right. It, it even, mm, even though it's not happening to you. So that's a well formless condition on how you do those things. That is how you choose how to use any other major input system to train somebody to make a distinction in any other input system. You would never use voice to train somebody to hear tonal distinctions as the marking system. You have to have it there as a display system so someone can hear the difference while you're marking it tactfully or visually. It's a submodality. You can use words rather than um, <coughs> for tone, tonal differences, like so up and down. So you could describe up and down. Yeah, you, you is, is that enough of a difference, or should it really be in another register? Well, let me say it this way. You always want to operate as close to experience as possible, because that's where learning occurs. If you offer people symbolic representations, they have to translate them into their experience. So there's an efficiency and an elegance to using direct experience as a, as a teaching device, as opposed to using words. And that's a justification for the claim I'm going to insist on here, that I'd like you to constantly strive to use primary experience as your route of communication as opposed to symbolic. The other problem, of course, is that unless you're very sensory specific in your symbolic representation linguistically, you're operating as a politician must. That is, you're providing a verbal Rorschach onto which the, the constituency will hallucinate their own needs. And you will arrive at understandings out there. There are buried as a number of people sitting in the room, at least. And that, that's quite appropriate in some contexts. You know, doing a group like this, I've got to be able to produce fluff and deliver it in such a congruent manner that every one of you know I'm talking to a point in your personal life. I can do that, and I can, I can use symbolic systems in a valued way, as opposed to what I caught many of you doing here, a barrage of words hoping that will stimulate some response over there. And that's the difference between a one-on-one -on -one and a group situation. You need to produce fluff and deliver it congruently and read non-verbally the response if you're going to do multi-person interactions. On a one-on-one -on -one or two or three, you can be very, very <coughs> precise and reduce the amount of verbiage because you're reading them and bringing them along with your own state serving as a guide. Other comments or questions about this uh, drill? Yeah. Um, I found sometimes I had difficulty as a audience member to hear when the the two states weren't really clearly sorted. For you internally or reading externally? Just reading it externally. Okay, that, that reminds me, I think it happened with Shirley, right? Is that your name, Shirley? Okay. Sure, when Shirley was a client, I happened to fall into her group over here in the corner. And they were going through making sure that there was a distinction, and there was some indication from the meta person that there wasn't as much a distinction as they hoped for. I propose the following rule. In a group where you're working with someone who's roughly as resourceful and as, as experienced as you all are, you're all in the same hari, you're hari mates, you're in the same moiety here, roughly the same experiential competencies, that if she congruently, surely tells me, if I can't see any difference or hear any difference between the two states, but she tells me there's a profound difference and she can sense it and she could, if, if uh, required, offer behavior that flows from one state as opposed to the other. And she's congruent in that representation. I accept that. And I make a note now that I need work on my sensory duty. Make the statement that someone's hard to read a spur to refining your own sensory apparatus. Go find the best poker player in Boulder and sit there until you can read him or her I wouldn't get in the game too soon. <laughs> I would sit on the outside and observe until I was pretty sure if I wanted to get in the game or not. But, but assume as an operating principle that anytime you can't make a distinction, there's only two possibilities. One, there isn't one there. And now you can use congruity in a peer relationship like this to know whether that's true or not. Shirley was quite congruent. So I invited the people to take that as a comment upon their sensory acuity. The more general rule when you're using it outside of a peer group like this situation is if you can't see or hear a distinction, there isn't one, unless the person with full congruity can represent that too. And you don't bother to anchor unless there's a distinction, because how would you know if you got it back later? So those are the important issues around that. Uh, there is no upper limit, as far as I can find so far, about how precise and acute 
how refined your sensory apparatus can become. There are special communities within the larger community of Boulder and other places that you come from who could offer you a tremendous education. The blind population in terms of auditory acuity. The deaf population in terms of visual acuity. I have a sister who's legally deaf. She's at Baudet, Washington, D.C. She's many, many years younger. I'm afraid to figure out how many. I'm the oldest nine. She's the youngest nine. So it's a big spread. I'm, my metaphor is in that conga right there. It's my current passion. I'm becoming an African drummer. She shows up at my house, never had any drumming lesson, and masters three of the most complex rhythms within about 20 minutes. Why? Watch her eyes. She has a lifetime of using those eyes to secure information about other person's movements, the lip reading, in terms of their body language which she's had to develop because she didn't have access to a certain class of experience. Is that a good way to train ourselves? I think it's a lovely experience, whether you think about it as training or in the sense of, of refining your own apparatus or coming to an appreciation of what another person's world model has to be if they have made compensations because of a neurological insult of some sort. <coughs> but I could almost feel her eyes on my hands as I was playing the rhythm and it came through her body so quickly. Uh, those people with those special situations that they have to address in a sighted and, and hearing world have developed com compensatory mechanisms which are, which should give you the, the, the flavor of what I'm trying to express when I say, I don't know of any upper limits on what you can learn to do. It has happened a dozen times in the group already that I have done or touched or said something which people will could tell you if they were, we were playing testimonial, was so precise about something about their personal life, their personal situation. I don't know how I know those things, but I don't have any doubt that those are accurate. And the ability, you, the, the, the more refined your sensory apparatus become, the more sensitized and responsive you're going to become to what are considered, quote, psychic phenomena by most people. That's not to say there aren't psychic phenomena of value is to say that until you know what you're getting through your sensory apparatus and refine that, there's not a lot of hope for you to sort out other channels. 